Let's go to John 3, um, verse 16. You know this so well. But let's go uh, for a few other verses as well. Let's start at verse 40. It says that, And yet no one has ever gone up to heaven, but there is one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. That's verse 30. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross, in order that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but have eternal life and live forever. Verse 16, For God so greatly, dearly prized the world, that He gave His only up His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Okay, so I just wanted to start off this broadcast with this message or this, these scriptures. That as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. And it's such a beautiful picture. So I want you to go with me. Let's go to uh, Numbers. Uh, it's Numbers chapter 21 verse 7 and the people came to Moses and said we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord uh, and against you pray to the Lord that he may take the serpents from us so Moses prayed for the people and then the Lord said to Moses make a fiery serpent and set him on a pole and everyone who is bitten and looks at it shall live. Everyone that looks at this serpent on the pole shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And if a serpent had bitten any man, when he looked to the serpent of bronze, he lived. Isn't that amazing? So I'll just uh, picture this uh, a little bit more. Just think of this. That in the desert, those snakes bit the people. Poisonous, venomous snakes <laughs> bit the, those people. And as they looked at the snake that Moses placed on a pole, they lived. So it's amazing. They, they just looked and they lived. Just hear this. They looked and they lived. They, they were about to die. They, that was, it was so bad. They were dying. And if anyone can just have the courage to just look up at the snake on the, on the pole, they would live. And so that is an amazing picture. But you see the reality of this picture is in John 3, where it says, God so greatly loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And then in verse 14 it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in Him will live. Alright, so it's the same story. The same picture that we see in the Old Testament is the fulfillment of it in Jesus Christ. And so they just had to look up. They just had to look up to the pole. Uh, the snake on the pole. And if they, they just looked and they lived. Alright, so that is the gospel of Jesus Jesus on the cross, it says, God so loved the world that He gave. He gave His Son to be crucified for me and for you. This is something that we can treasure today and say, Thank you, Jesus, that you gave, that you gave your life to save us. What greater love is there than this? That a man would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. He died on that cross. And if we are able to look at Him today, and we're going to do it this morning, if we are able to look at Him, if we are able to look at the snake on the pole, the true fulfillment of that shadow, Jesus Christ, if we can look at Jesus, we will live. And that life is not just spiritual life, but it's, it's life. Spirit, soul, body. Now I want to just um, go to where... The Israelites were going out of Egypt and you know the, the, where we, we get the Passover from in Exodus where they put the, the blood on the doorpost and death passed over. I want you to just page with me to Exodus. Let's go there. It's in Exodus 12. I'll just, I'll just start off here.
tell all the congregation of Israel, verse 3, On the tenth day of this month, they shall take every man a lamb or a kid, according to the family of which he is the father, a lamb or a kid for each house. And if the household is too small to consume the lamb, let him and his next door neighbor take in according to the number of persons, every man according to what each can eat shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb or kid shall be without blemish. Listen to this. It shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill this lamb in the evening. They shall take up of the blood and put it on the two sides of the lintel of the houses in which they shall eat. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted its head, its legs and its inner parts. You shall not um, let you shall let nothing of the meat remain until the morning. And so forth. Let, let's just continue. And you shall eat thus. <laughs> right? It says, Your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and will smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, beast against, um, and against all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood shall be for a token assigned to you upon the doorposts of the houses where you are, that when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. All right, so a lot of people read this story and then just draw it right into the New Testament. And here's the thing, the God of the old is the, is the same God. The God of the old, the God of the New Testament. But the agreement is totally different. And Christ came to die for the sins of the world. He came as that lamb that was slaughtered for me and for you. So he died. He paid the price. He died on that cross. The cross made a difference. All right? So it's no longer a case of, you know... Um, God bringing sickness upon people to teach them, to humble them, to change them. It's no longer God bringing that sickness. Sickness is in this world. But God is the one that is for us and is not against us. All right. And in that sense, you can, we can look at it in many different ways. But what I can say is the cross made a difference. We can now go into God allowed those things to happen because he's, there's no death in him. And we can speak about those things. But for me, the starting point for Christianity is the cross. The cross made a difference. So whatever you believe concerning, uh, you know, what actually happened in Egypt, what happened in the old covenant, you know, you see all those stories of, of people being destroyed and you see that, those pictures. Whatever happened there, what's most important for you to understand is what happened at the cross for you. And that's the starting point of Christianity, the cross. Is the start of, of my life in Christ. And the cross made a difference. God so loved the world. That's what the Bible says. It's, it doesn't say God just, you know, send his son. And, but he was actually angry. And it says God so loved the world that he gave. So the father gave the son. The father um, is the one that loved us so much. That he gave his son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his son. So in the old and the new, there's a difference. And the difference is the cross between the old and the new. And the difference is now sin came upon the body of Jesus Christ. All right. So it's no, no longer a thought that we need to think that God is sending this, sending this plague. And now we just need to make sure that we you know, miss the, the, the plague because God is actually angry with the world and is punishing the world. No, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The, the agreement changed between God and His people. Even the whole world is now 
in favor, so to speak. God loves the world. He's not counting up their sins against them. They have to believe it and accept it to be saved. But God so loved the world still remains true even now. All right, so I'll just continue with this message. So it says that the blood shall be a token or a sign to you upon your houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. So they were protected. Say they were protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. They were protected by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? All right. So now in, in, in Egypt, the blood was the protection. Now understand that in that house, it didn't matter who was in the house, what they did the day before. If they were in the house and the blood was on the doorpost, they were protected. All right. They were protected by the blood of an animal, <laughs> a sign and a token. All right. That sign, you know, shows us or points to the reality of that sign and his name is Jesus. This morning, let's just recap a little. Let me just go slow, slow this morning and get back to, to, to the message. In Israel, in Egypt, the blood was on the doorpost and that was the protection. In the desert, that was before that time, Moses lifted up a snake on a pole. Those who looked, lived. These are two shadows of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. The serpent on the pole and the blood on the doorpost. <laughs> Both speaks and points to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Jesus that died on that cross. So it's pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. So God so loved the world that he gave his son. In all, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. All right, so to this morning, if you believe in Jesus, you have the blood of Jesus all over you. You don't have to try and get the blood. I mean, I believe you can by faith um, speak uh, about the blood of Jesus or say the blood of Jesus covers me and, and stuff like that. But it's actually having faith in what the blood has done that protects you. It's faith in the blood. It's faith in what his blood accomplished for you. And this morning you can know, now you can know that his blood accomplished for you more than what you can ever imagine. You are protected. You are kept safe. You are guarded by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus um, was enough for all your sin of all time. He washed you in his blood. He paid the price for you. So believing in what the blood of Jesus Christ did. That is your protection today. And that is what keeps you safe. That is what heals you, restores you. And, and, and it's all about what the blood has done. And faith in what the blood has done. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 11 this morning. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11. Alright, so I want us to take communion together. And just look at what Jesus did. There's, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> There's nothing else that you need to do. You don't need to get your, your act together, so to speak. You don't, don't need to change yourself. You don't even need to stop trying to try or stop fearing, trying not to fear. You don't even need to, 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 to depend on yourself in any way. All we're going to do this morning is we're going to partake of the communion. And by doing so, we are looking at our the, 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 the reality of the snake on the pole, Jesus Christ. We are looking at the sacrifice of Jesus. By doing so, we know that we are protected by the blood and that the blood of Jesus covers us and removes all our sins. It's not just a covering today. It's actually a cleansing, a removing of all sin and guilt. If we can look at Him, we will live. Now, I explained previously in some of the programs that sin came in and death as a result of sin. So, death spread to all men because of the fall of man. God did not create us to die. He didn't create the world to die. Death came in through sin. Sickness came in through sin. That's how sin and death entered into this world. But Jesus came as a sacrifice for sin. This is such good news this morning. He died for you. He's as a sacrifice for sin. He came. 
All right, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. I think when it comes to the communion, um, it probably became more, more of, a, of a curse to a lot of people because of the wrong way of perceiving and, and partaking of the communion. If we do it in the right way and we see the reality or the truth that it brings, you will rejoice and you will forever just take communion by faith. Communion cannot save you. You are saved because of what Jesus did on the cross and your faith in what he did. But communion is an act of faith based on what you believe. And that's the power of communion. It's the same as baptism. Baptism cannot save you. But it's an act of faith in, because of what you believe. That you, you, your sins are forgiven. You died with Christ. You were raised with Him. You are seated with Him in heavenly places. Communion is the same. It's an act of faith based on what you believe. Now, what do you believe? You be believe that Jesus died for you on the cross. Your sins are forgiven. But also through your faith in Him. And because um, of your faith in Him, you became a new creation. And you were united with Him. He came and He lived in, He, he made His home in you. You are in Him. You are one with Him. Say, I am one with Christ. I am one with Christ. Just speak it out. Say, I am one with Christ Jesus. Alright, so that's what, what, what you believe. That's what you believe. And when you take communion, you have to, to think of what you believe. That your sins are forgiven. That the price was paid. That the blood flowed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that you are one with Him. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 11. This is going to bless you. And, and today, we're going to receive the benefits of the cross and, and of taking communion in the right perspective. And I'm telling you, things will change. <laughs> There's going to be power released, signs and wonders, glory, just because of this morning and the faith that we have in what Christ did for us. This morning, we're going to look and live. <laughs> we're going to get, have our eyes on Jesus and see what he accomplished for us. All right, here we go. I'm taking a little bit of time, but here we go. 1 Corinthians 11. Oh, Jesus. Now, Paul explains something here. And he's speaking of the communion. These guys were coming together. They were having a feast. They were drinking. That it was, but they, the problem was not so much with the feast part. The problem was they didn't even know what they were partaking of. And so Paul was correcting this church and he, he, you could see he wasn't happy with what happened around the communion there. And, and the thing is, it's not just, like I said, his point was not the fact that they were feasting. The point that he wanted to make, the problem was they didn't recognize the body of Christ and what he did. They didn't see what Jesus did. So let's look at it here. He says, um, he says, so when you gather for your meetings, verse 20, it is not the supper instituted by the Lord that you eat. Now, if he refers to this, it means there's a supper instituted by the Lord. All right. And now he says this, you are not partaking of the supper of the Lord. The way you are doing it, guys, you are not partaking of the supper of the Lord. He says, for each, of one, each one hurries to get his own supper first. And one goes hungry while another gets drunk. This wasn't a really... I can understand why Paul was a little bit um, frustrated with these guys. He says one hurries to eat, the others are drunk. It wasn't good. Alright? And you can see Paul is really not impressed. He says, what? Do you have no houses to eat or drink? He says... Or do you despise the church of God and mean to show contempt for it while you humiliate those who are poor? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Okay, this is the tough part. So he says, I, I, I cannot commend you in this. What you are doing is really, I can't even imagine that you are doing this uh, it, it this way. But that's not the point. You need to get to the... To the, to the part of the message that I want to get to. He says, for I received, aha, now we're getting to it. 
For I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was treasurely, uh, treasurously delivered up, and while his betrayal was in progress, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to call me to remembrance. Now, Paul shifts this uh, message. He says, guys, you're coming together. You're having a party. You're drinking. It's not this. The, the party is not the problem. The, the, the real problem is you are not recognizing and seeing what the Lord's body really means. Or partaking of the Lord's body and partaking of the communion. He says, he says because... I received, then he's shifting it from really just correcting them to, to, to the truth. He says, I received from the Lord himself what I am giving to you. It means this thing that I've received from the Lord, I am, I, I've given it to you. I've shared with you. And let me remind you of what I shared. It says, I received from, from the Lord himself, which I passed on to you. In other words, he already gave them the revelation and, and why they need to partake. All right. So he says, he says, when the Lord was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this and call me to remembrance. Similarly, when the supper was ended, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new agreement, testament, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and call me to remembrance. Now there's the three verses. He says, I received from the Lord himself what I passed on to you. Now, there's a lot of people that reason that, you know, um, communion is no longer needed and we don't need to take communion because we're already one with the Lord and all kinds of things. But Paul said, I pass this on to you. It, it's not just something that he said lightly. He said, I pass this on to you and what I've given you, I've received from the Lord himself. So Paul received the revelation of the communion from the Lord and he passed it on to them. All right. And so, and he said, and he and explained to them, he said, the Lord took that night, he took bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup. He said, this is the cup, uh, the, uh, the New Testament in my blood. All right. He says, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. Okay. So that's what, that's what he passed on. Now, what is the story then further? Why was Paul so frustrated with these guys and why did he correct them so strongly let's read on he says so then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in a way that is unworthy first of all notice it doesn't mean the person is unworthy it is taken in a way that is unworthy let's get that out of the way because there's no way that you can be worthy enough to partake of the communion that would be, no one will, like, if, if you need to be worthy based on your own performance, if you need to be worthy, no one will be able to take communion. Let's just settle that. All right? But he says it's in an unworthy way, and he explains what it is. We'll be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drink without recognizing with due appreciation that it is Christ's body. All right, before I continue. Now it says the unworthy way. I'll explain it to you. You need to understand that it's Christ's body. You need to understand that you are doing this in remembrance of him of what he did for you on the cross and that you are partaking of his body and his blood in, 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 in the communion. So it's not literally for me, it's not about looking at that bread and, and trying to understand that that bread is the body. That bread we take by faith 
as the body of the Lord. So I, I, Jesus said it is his body. So I, I'm not saying it's a symbol, it's a, it's a, it's a sign. I, I say this is his body because Jesus said this is his body. But what I'm actually speaking of when I say under, or when, what the scripture speaks of here is to understand what the body of Christ, the broken body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus accomplished for you. What it did for you. To be able to see that. To be able to believe that. Even though I say this is the body of Christ broken for me. It's, it's the body and you, you look at the, the bread and understand it's the body. But with that, it's not complete if you're not understanding actually what Christ did for you on the cross. Alright, so I'll explain more. Let's just continue. Just stay with me. You're going to be blessed. It's not what you... Um, maybe some of you know this already. But it's not, for a lot of you, this is going to be a revelation of how to partake in the communion. And it's going to change your life. And if you get this, you're going to just do it often. As often <laughs> as you get together. Or as often. You're going, to do it, you're going to do it regularly. Okay, listen to this. He says, So whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup uh, in a way that is unworthy will be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. Let a man examine himself. So shall he eat. For anyone who eats and drinks of the, um, this cup and the body eats and drinks a sentence upon himself. That is the reason why many of you are weak and sickly and quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. Listen carefully. Here's the thing. The body and the blood. It says a man should examine himself. Now, I'm just wanna, I just want to use this time to break away or break down some of the lies that we believe. That we'll be able to just partake in, in joy and in peace. Alright? So, here's what people believe. You need to examine yourself. Scanning yourself. Thinking if you are in a place that, that, that you are worthy to partake. Now listen, it doesn't say you must be worthy. It says you must, you must not take it in an unworthy manner. You will never be worthy enough based on your own performance. But you are worthy based on your faith in Jesus Christ. And you are part of the body of Christ. You are washed. You are cleansed. You are perfected. But if you partake in an unworthy way, you should rather just examine yourself and then partake. Now this examining of yourself is not looking at your faults and your failures. This examining is to examine if you understand that it is the Lord's body. That's the only examining. That's the only self-examination. That's the only looking at self. Taking a little time thinking of, am I realizing this is his body? And if you realize that it's the body of Jesus Christ and it's the blood of Jesus. If you realize that, if you understand that, you're partaking in a worthy manner. So it's basically just understanding that this is the body broken for you. This is the blood that flowed for the forgiveness of your sins. Looking at the elements and then what the elements actually stands for and the cross of Jesus Christ. It's basically a time where you look at what Jesus did on the cross. It also says here that you must do it in remembrance. Now, think about it. I don't have to remember Jesus. Jesus is with me. I speak to him every day. I've talk, I talked to him yesterday. I talked to him this morning. <laughs> All right. I, like he's with me. But the remembrance part is to remember what he did on the cross. To remember what he did. Remember the shadow was the, the blood on the doorpost. That was just a picture. And it's just, it's, it's just a, a, a small picture. It's not the reality of what Jesus did. So, so they were looking ahead. And, 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 and they had to wait until it actually happened, what the shadow um, stood for. We look back to what Christ already did. And we look to the cross. And so if we partake of the communion and we look to the cross, we are partaking in a worthy manner. <laughs> now, for me, again, it's not the technical thing that the actual bread is the body. It's also that. But I believe the, the results of the communion lies in the fact that you understand what Jesus did for you on the cross. That is the result. 
if you take the body and the blood, I also believe that it's the body and it's the blood because Jesus said it. I don't reason about it. <laughs> In John 6, he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He partake of, of, of my flesh and blood. And that's the picture, again, of the reality of the thing, that when we take communion, we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus. So, I hope you get my perspective. It's important to understand the bread is the blood and the, the, the wine is, uh, the bread is the body and the wine is the blood. But what's even more important is what Christ did on the cross, understanding what it actually represents. And that's the cross of Jesus. And that's what I mean when you discern and understand and understand what Christ did on the cross, you will live. That is in connection with all the rest of the Bible. That is the same picture that they, they had when they had to look at the snake on the pole and they live. They, they had to just look and live. Jesus was lifted up and if we look to the cross, we will live. When we take communion, what do we do? We look to the cross. We look at what Jesus did. We have our eyes there. And when our eyes are there, we are partaking in a worthy manner. All right, let's go slowly again. I read something that probably a lot of you have a lot of questions about. It says here, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup uh, in an unworthy manner, it says, eats and drinks upon himself. Judgment. Oh, pastor. <laughs> okay. Now this verse, this single verse and the misunderstanding here kept a lot of people from the benefits of communion. In fact, if you don't understand this verse and you partook or partake of the communion, I don't know what you did with that verse, to be honest. Because if you really understand it, you know, you, 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 you bring a sentence upon yourself. If you do it wrongly, you know, and you thought you must just examine yourself, get rid of all your sin before, before you partook of the communion. And so you thought that God is judging you based on that. Let's, let's look at this. Eats and drinks judgment upon himself or sentence, a sentence upon himself. The whole world is under a sentence or so to speak judgment because of sin. Sin entered and death through sin. And so because of the fall of man, there's a divine, you can call it divine judgment or sentence that's upon this world. Sin came in, sickness came in, death came in. So when you do not recognize the Lord's body, if you do not understand that it's the body of the, uh, the Lord and it's the blood of Jesus, if you partake not in that worthy manner, you bring upon yourself the sentence that's already upon this world. In other words, you'll remain sick. You'll remain under the influence of sin, sickness and death. Because you are failing to see the way out. The way out is the cross of Jesus. Communion is a way of escape from the divine sentence that's upon this world. This is good news. It means that no person ever took communion and became sick because of it. They just partook in the wrong way and couldn't receive the benefits and remained in sin, sickness and death like the rest of the world. Under the influence of death and destruction. God did not bring death and destruction. He came to save you from destruction. He came to heal you, restore you. Jesus was the sacrifice for sin. He took the sin of the world upon himself. When he died on that cross and he said, it is finished. He took the course of sickness and death in his own body when he died. Therefore, he took your sin and he took the effects of your sin. He took it upon himself. He died on that cross. And now if we can understand that he did it, <laughs> we escape from the sentence or the judgment that's already upon this world. Do you understand? There's a, there's a result of sin or there's an effect of sin that's ruling in this world and it's sickness and death. Communion is your way out of the world's way 
of being sick and dying, dying. It's, it's God's way to bring you into life and abundant life. This is good news. <laughs> so when you partake of the communion, you have something that you are doing in faith. And because you are doing it in faith, it brings life to your body. It brings healing to your body. It restores you and it brings you out of the influence of, of sin. It brings you out of the effects of the fall of man.